Penelope Prince and Vincent Viscount from the Palace Press bringing you all the latest news and views from the Royal Jews. And there's a dark cloud hovering over the Royal Palace today. King Ahab is on the throne and the prophet Elijah is on the run. The weather report says that it's cloudy with a chance of corruption. Ooh, let's join Palace reporter Roy Allstuff for the inside scoop. Dark clouds indeed, Penelope. This is not the palace we knew a few kings ago. King Ahab might wear the crown, but the big question is, who wears the pants? Meet the woman herself, Queen Jezebel. Roy, darling. <coughs> you naughty man. <coughs> Queen Jezebel, you're not from the people of Israel, are you? Of course not, darling. I couldn't think of anything worse. I was Princess Jezebel of the Sidonians. And then you married Ahab. I did. Such a sweetie. He is an idiot though. Can't make up his mind. Goes off in sulks. He's so pathetic. But, honey, he's nothing I can't handle. <clears throat> My sources tell me that Ahab was bad enough before he met you. But once you got married, you led him astray. To follow idols and to do horrible things which God hates. Oh darling, so vulgar. I liberated him. The God of Israel is such a stuffy old fusspot. Don't do this, don't do that. Follow me with all your heart and I'll look after you. It's so yesterday. Ouch. Aren't you worried that the God of goodness and justice who made the whole universe will hear you? Oh, pesh. I worship the idol Baal. He's fabulous. Let you do whatever you want. The better, the better. And let me tell you a secret, Royal. I'm not always a good girl. <coughs> uh, what's that, Penelope? Back to the studio. We have to leave it there, folks. This is Royal stuff saying the same thing God told Elijah after Mount Carmel. Run far and run fast. Good night, shalom, and cheerio. Kia ora. Uh, all around us are these competing ideas or tribes. Have you noticed this? Let's kick off with a little game to see what group you fall into. So in the host chat, just jot down whether you are the first one of these or the second one of these. Here's the first one. Apple versus PC. If you're an Apple person, write Apple. If you're a PC user, write PC. I'm Apple through and through, as you can probably see. Uh, dogs versus cats. More of a dog person or cat person. Perhaps with being online, you might be one of those people that watch all the cat videos on YouTube. Uh, I'm more of a dog person. Sorry if I have offended you cat people today. Uh, phone versus text. Uh, are you, do you tend to text people as the primary way that you connect with them or do you call them to connect with them? I think uh, texting is so much easier, isn't it? Though I personally like to get on the phone. Then, of course, the most controversial one, Toilet paper hung over or toilet paper hung under? And I don't think we're going to solve that ongoing debate today. But all that's a bit of fun as we consider some competing ideas. But the part that's actually not so much fun is considering all the com competing demands and responsibilities that are the reality of our lives. So think about it. We, we have work. We have family. We have you know, all, the, all the kids or your nephew's events. And, and all these things can just like, like add clutter and noise to our lives. Of course, on top of that, there's keeping fit. There's the, the, the bank gets in there too with its rising and uh, increasing mortgage costs and, and rising costs of living and a need to look a particular way. And then, you know, even different ministries at church can feel like they want their bit from us too. On top of that is the priority to, to keep all of this in balance or at least look like we've got it in balance. And all this noise is about different promises and different ideas about identity, about success, and all making demands on us, making it hard to hear what God is saying to us. And our lives are becoming full of clutter with competing demands, and it all gets too much. Can you relate? <laughs> you know, as we come to our story today, the Israelites are in this conundrum. Uh, their lives are cluttered with competing loyalties and allegiances, and, and life just isn't going well for them. And all this happens through the influence of a royal couple called uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Now, it's been about 40 or 50 years since the kingdom divided by Rehoboam's actions. 
If you remember last week, the tribes of Israel divided into these two kingdoms. The ten tribes formed the northern kingdom of Israel, and then two tribes formed the southern kingdom of Judah. And the rest of our series is going to focus on some of the kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. But today we're going to look at one of the kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. And all there's like 19 of them and 100% of these kings, there's a particular phrase used about them. They did what was evil in the Lord's sight. All of them. So Ahab and his wife Jezebel certainly reflect the epitome of this kingdom of the northern space. All the kingdoms are reflected in their life. This is how their story is introduced. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than any of the kings before him. He married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonites, and he began to bow down in the worship of Baal. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the kings of Israel before him. So when Ahab married Jezebel, she brought more to the marriage than just increasing trade with another country and, of course, the relationship. She brings with her this aggressive propaganda of Baal worship. Now, now Baal was this idol, a a so-called god who was worshipped in the area. And he had long attempted to supplant the place of Yahweh, the Christian God, in the hearts of his people. So Ahab and Jezebel built this splendid temple for Baal right in the heart of the new capital city, Samaria. And it's, it's a very clear message. You know, the southern tribes have a temple to Yahweh over in Jerusalem. The northern tribes now have a temple to Baal, who now calls their allegiance and, and their worship. Uh, here's an artist impression of Baal. And as you can see in the picture, there's, there's a worshiper there offering worship to Baal. And the reason there's plants in the picture is because Baal was seen to be the fertility god, the god who was responsible for your crops and wheat growing, to, uh, for, for your cattle to have calves, for, for you to have and have sons and daughters yourself. And, and they would worship Baal in the hope that Baal would provide this flourishing and prosperous life to the worshippers. Now, Jezebel didn't begin Baal worship, but she was this adamant evangelist for Baal. In fact, she financially supported 450 prophets of Baal. And at the same time, she ensured that the worship of Yahweh became illegal. So she sought to have all the prophets of Yahweh assassinated in order to stamp out the worship of God. And and if you stood up and said, no, no, we're going to serve Yahweh. He's our real God. I mean, you could get killed for that because Baal worship is now the national religion. And the people who once sat around the the meal table and and declared, give thanks to God for he is good, now give grace at that same table and say, give thanks to Baal for he is good. You see, the primary space in the hearts of the people is now centered not around God, but around Baal. And there arrives on the scene a prophet of God named Elijah. Elijah's name means Yahweh is God. And he has a very simple message to let people know Yahweh is God. Uh, Yahweh needs to be the very center of your life. Clear away the, the clutter in your life and ensure that you're hearing the voice of God as the primary voice. The primary space in your life needs to be reserved for the one who ultimately deserves it. Now, perhaps you can relate to all the competing noise and demands that are placed on your life. And amidst all the the noise and competition of all these demands, it's easy for the voice of God to be drowned out. And you get distracted. Or you begin to find your identity in something different to who God says that you are. And if that's you, my prayer today is that you will find clarity on what it looks like to, to clear away the stage of, uh, in your life with all that noise and the constant demands and the affection and the allegiance and it goes to all these other places and reserve that primary space in your heart for the one who deserves it. Now, typically, there are five movements that I've noticed that people tend to move through, go through, as they clean out these competing demands that pull on their hearts. Of course, there could be other movements than these ones, but I want to focus on these ones today because as a pastor, I've typically seen these are the movements people go through as they move from being in a uh, hopeless, unhealthy place to moving to a healthy, hopeful place where God is right at the center. So here's movement one, to see the problem. You see, in the case of Israel, the drought is what got their attention. 
Remember, the people have sold themselves out to worshiping Baal because they believe he's responsible for bringing the rain. Uh, he, he's behind the crops growing. So Elijah, the prophet of God, shows up in front of the king and he says, As surely as Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives, the God whom I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. You know, if you're going to rely on Baal for the rain to produce your crops, I'm praying that God will send a drought. And no more rain until you, Israel, turn back to the real God. Now, this is Bold language. I mean, these kind of words could have you killed. So Elijah says what he needs to say as a prophet of God, and then he gets out of there. And there are three years without rain. Now, as you can imagine, I guess the first year is pretty hard, but I guess there's some reserves. The second year comes, the people plant their seeds, the hope of a better way forward. But because there's no water for the new crop, nothing grows. Third year comes around, what was hard now gets even harder. That There's no seed to plant. And what's the point anyway? There's no water. There's no income, there's, there's no food, there's, there's nothing. You see, God is withholding his blessing from his people. And this is exactly what Solomon had warned the people would happen if they turned to follow other gods. Uh, we heard it in, in his prayer at the opening of the temple where Solomon said, if the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, see what he's saying there, and if they pray and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins, then God, would you hear and would you forgive? You see, the absence of rain is a reminder to the people that they have turned away from God. Now, I have to be careful here about something because there are all kinds of difficult things that can happen in life. And they don't have to mean that God is disciplining you. It, it might be the upheaval in your job. It might be family difficulties. It might be horrid illnesses. And it doesn't mean that God is behind it all. Sometimes the nastiness of life comes our way and is not related to our behavior. In this case, it is related to Israel's behavior. Baal is now at the center stage of their home, of their life. And the rain stops because God is trying to get the people's attention. You know, sometimes the only way we will listen is when things come crashing down around us and we see the emptiness of what our lives have become. Sometimes we need to find ourselves in some sort of drought before we are ready to move forward. But movement one always begins with, with seeing the problem before us. And then this leads to movement two, to recognize you have a choice. And you begin to transition from recognizing the problem to recognizing you have a choice to make. In other words, will you continue on the path you're on or will you change your allegiance and go down a new pathway? But you can't have it both ways. You can't go down two paths. You see, after three years, Elijah comes back on the scene and he, and he gathers the people and says, hey, I, 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 need, I, I need you to come close. I, I want to talk to you. And he invites the people to a place called Mount Carmel. Now, this is a picture of Mount Carmel here on the screen. Uh, this is one of the, the many ridges along the 26-kilometer ridge line of Mount Carmel. And somewhere along there is where Elijah gathered the people. And the place is significant, I think, for a couple of reasons. For one, it's significant because of what you see when you're up on the ridge. Now, it's not what you see when you look at Mount Carmel. It's what you see when you're looking from Mount Carmel. And this is what you see, the Jezreel Valley. Now, normally this would be one of the most fertile, lush, agriculturally rich spots anywhere in the area. Its very name means fertile garden because it's sort of just heavier rainfall than anywhere else in the country. But of course, after three years of drought, you can imagine this whole area is baked and barren. You see, from this spot, the people can see the devastation of the drought right in front of them. And so the place is significant because it's a reminder of their problem. It's staring them in the face. The place is also significant, I think, for a second reason. This place came to be known as one of the most important places for the worship of Baal. In fact, one of the kings around this time refers to Mount Carmel as Baal's Bluff. Effectively, Elijah is going to the very headquarters for Baal. And in a sense, he's highlighting the cause of their problem. So Elijah stands in front of the people and he says, how much longer are you going to waver between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, we'll follow after him. If Baal is God, we'll follow after him. It's like this is a crossroads moment. He says, if Baal is the true God, just go for it. I can imagine him kind of glancing over at the, the valley and saying, well, it hasn't been going well for you, right? I mean, look at it. 
But here's the thing. If Yahweh is the real God, go after him. Go all in. Give him the primary space in your life. Reserve it for Yahweh. Now, my guess is that if you ask the people privately, hey, hey do you worship Yahweh? You know, they would have said, well, sure. I mean, he called our ancestor Abraham. He, he rescued us from slavery, placed us in this land. Oh, and do you worship Baal? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, I mean, Baal promises us a, a prosperous and, and flourishing life. I mean, he gave us our son and daughters, didn't he? Didn't he? And we're hoping that our, our crops are going to grow again because he's promised us. So we, we're worshiping him. We, we're calling out to him. And Elijah says to the people, as you can't go down two pathways, choose one. If Baal is the true God, follow him. If Yahweh is the true God, follow him. Now, now think about it, I guess like marriage. Let's imagine bride and groom are, are right there at the front of the church. But the bride wants an open marriage where she's not restricted to one partner. She wants to have multiple partners. But the husband, well, he wants an exclusive relationship, you know, just her. Is it going to work? You see, God wants an exclusive relationship with you and me. His desire is that we look his way and we say, forsaking all others, I take you to be my God for, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish for as long as I live, God. In fact, one day the people ask God, what does God want most? And the people asking it actually worded it differently. They said, well, what's the greatest commandment? But Really, it's the same question. What does God want most? Do you remember how Jesus answered it? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He wants all of you. This exclusive relationship where the, the stage of your life is cleared of everything that competes. So how do you do that? You know, I've got four kids at school, I've got work to do, I've got bills to pay, like, like many others, we've got this massive mortgage, the rates are going up, the cost of living, well, it's getting absurd, isn't it? So how do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all, all this going on? So let's break it down in some quadrants here for a moment. So see, typically, our life is full of, at least in these four quadrants, we've got relationships, we've got our stuff, We've got our work or study. We've got our, our family or the wider whānau that you're part of. And Jesus says, I want all your heart. I want all your soul, mind, and strength. So what does that mean? So what Jesus means is that he wants to be primary over all of these areas in life. He, he wants to speak into each of these. So we invite him to direct our relationships. We ask him to lead us in our relationship with our stuff and make sure we have the right idea of what our money can do and can't do for us. We bring our career, our study under his domain, believing that when we, when we work or study in, in a good way, it honors him. And we make sure we don't find our identity in what we do. And we ask him to be the, the very center of our family, however complicated it might be. See, see, ultimately, what we're asking is that he be at the center of all this. And we reserve the primary space in our life to be led by him. Now, typically, there's a point where we say, Jesus, I'm in. And then we begin this, this journey of discovering what this actually looks like. And we start to find out there's actually a lot of various specific decisions to make. So I come to realize that the way my relationship is currently is not under his leadership. And so I make that decision in my life. Or I realize actually my money is not actually under his influence. And so I, I'm at this crossroads moment around that. And I, I choose which pathway I'm going to go down. Or my work or my family needs to be led by King Jesus with him actually calling the shots and not the other way around. So perhaps right now there's actually something in Elijah's story already challenging you, actually calling you to make a decision. And perhaps it's time to invite God to change the way you think about your relationships, your money, your stuff, your family, and as you go down a different pathway than the one that you're on. See, this is your crossroads moment. Will you stay in the course you're on, and that doesn't actually seem to be working so well, or will you change course and give that primary space and allegiance to God? You see, right there on the hillside, Elijah is saying to the people, hey, you've got to make a decision. You, you can't play it both ways. If Yahweh is the real God, put him at the center. Do you know what the people said? Nothing. Zippo. They're not prepared to make a decision. 
I, I guess they're conflicted. I guess they're confused. And even though they're staring at the drought, you know, it's right there in front of them. They don't know what to do. Of course, this leads to movement number three. See the empty promises of your idols. So Elijah stands up and he says, hey, let's have a God contest. Whichever God wins, this is the God who should be followed. It's a showdown of the gods. So it's a picture of the scene. On one side, you have King Ahab and all of his entourage. In addition, you have 450 prophets of Baal and another 400 prophets of Asherah, which is another kind of God supporting the, the tribe of Baal. Remember, all these prophets have hometown advantage. They're on Baal's turf. It's like this is the Eden Park of all black rugby and Elijah, like some outlier Irish player, is laying down the challenge to the all blacks right in their home turf. And Elijah is going to the home center of Baal and he's about to step into a contest, giving them home team advantage. So if there's you know, a thousand prophets and entourage on, on one side all cheering for Baal, uh, who do we have on the other side representing Yahweh? Well, <laughs> there's Elijah. <laughs> It's just, just one. It can be pretty lonely on that side at times, can't it? And from this vantage point, Elijah calls for this showdown of the gods. And the idea is very simple. Uh, he and, and the prophets of Baal are going to put wood on their altars, on their own altars. They're going to sacrifice a bull. And then they're going to ask their God to send down the fire from heaven. So Elijah brings out these two bulls. He, he gets the prophets of Baal to choose which bull they want. He doesn't want you know, to be accused of kind of interfering with, with you know, what they're going to be using to sacrifice. And then you know, um, the only rule here is that the people can't light their own fire. There's no matches involved. Uh, they have to have their God initiate the fire and burn up the bull that's lying there on the altar. Uh, that's, that's the only rules of this God showdown. Now, now, all this should please the prophets of Baal because Baal was known as the lightning god. In fact, in many of the archaeological pictures of Baal that uh, have been ascribed to him, we, we often see Baal as, as with a thunderbolt in his left hand. So the prophets of Baal go first. No doubt they're full of confidence. This is going to be over quickly, they're probably thinking. And they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, we read, shouting, O Baal, answer us! <laughs> But there was no reply of any kind. They danced, toppling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. And for you sports fanatics, you notice Elijah does some serious sledging and trash talk. It's right here in the Bible. He says, you'll have to shout louder, he scoffed. For perhaps, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or he's relieving himself. You know, he's in the toilet. Or, or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep or needs to be awakened. <laughs> He's having a good time. And the prophets are so desperate, they start like self-harming in the hope that Baal will see their blood, get really excited, take them seriously. But all this frenzy, it produces no fire from Baal's thunderbolt. It's a complete failure. See, see God is at work exposing their counterfeit gods. We see, um, JD, you can count on me from this message to, you know, make sure I'm not going to go out and worship Baal anymore. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that's my takeaway from today. Yeah, that's not really going to be something we struggle with, right? But God is still at work exposing our counterfeit gods. God is still at work exposing our counterfeit gods. Now, there's a well-known quote that goes, there is a God-shaped vacuum in every man that only God can fill. Have you heard this before? And it goes back a, a long way to the 300s by a man named St. Augustine. Question, is that true? Is it really true? And if it's true, why is it true? You see, Author and pastor Steve Mannion answers these questions spot on. I've drawn a whole lot from him in today's talk. And it, it talks about our lives as this kind of this bottomless pit of, of neediness and desire. He says, you know, picture the inside of, of a massive well. You know, it's like you, you drop that 50 cent coin down the well and it takes like forever before you hear that ding. It's like we have this massive void, he says, in, in our heart. And we're trying to fill it with all this stuff and noise in our lives. Some of you might be trying to fill it with approval. Perhaps you grew up in a household where you were not affirmed and you learned that, that when you worked hard, well, you got affirmation. And so you worked hard, too hard, hoping to hear some praise. 
And you long for people to notice you, to affirm you, but no good word is ever good enough. No praise or affirmation will ever fill that bottomless pit. For others of you right now, it's not approval from work, it's approval of your body. But no sculpted body will ever be sculpted enough. In fact, if you ever meet somebody that's just looks absolutely stunning, my guess is that that person would actually look at themselves in the mirror and they would see flaws in themselves. And that's why they do surgery. They get fixated on treatments and procedures and techniques, trying to chase a younger and younger look, trying to fight that aging process. But it's never enough because we have this bottomless pit. For some of you, it's about success, about meeting all the, all the KPIs and the sales targets. But the same way, no success is ever successful enough. You know, I was in business in my, in my 20s as a commercial insurance underwriter. I remember that first year, you know, hitting targets. It felt good. And then the next year came around and you see like the same accounts and be like, what, more targets to hit? And it's just relentless. It's this infinite well that can never be satisfied. Or the amount of money you make. You notice it's never enough. Perhaps you once thought that if you made like $60,000, you'd be rich. <laughs> and, and when that became your annual salary, you pursued more. And then 100000 became the target. And then 150000 and And then you find that actually more money, more salary is never enough. Why? It's a bottomless pit. It's never satisfied. Uh, some might chase some erotic experience. It, it might be going down the pit of pornography. And, and, and you try to pull yourself away, but there's this, this constant vacuum for more and more. Why? Because there's a hole in my heart and it is never filled. You see, in the 1600s, a French man named Blaise Pascal, who was a like, philosopher, mathematician, scientist, inventor, theologian, so really smart guy, he expanded on that quote from St. Augustine and he said, There is a God shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus. You see, when we look to other things and the hope that they will fill that hole, we will constantly be disappointed. See, Elijah is seeking to expose the futility of idols the people we're following. But we all have these idols, all of us. And it might be a good thing in and of itself. But you see, when that thing or relationship or experience becomes the ultimate thing, it's become an idol that's competing with the real God. And that thing or relationship or experience is now making promises and making demands on us. But then we age or we lose our job or we face a health challenge or a pandemic hits and reminds us actually humanity is more vulnerable than we were told we were. Or inflation hits and we realize money can't be trusted like we once believed. And suddenly all these idols are exposed to what they really are and their false promises and their uh, the, the false gods, the false, you know, the demands they're making, they make no sense. And we see that the security and identity we were looking for can't be found there. See, Elijah is seeking to expose Baal as a fraud, a counterfeit, and the hope that people will turn back to Yahweh to find where their identity and security can really be found. Now, this God contest is designed to help them see the one who really is the one who deserves our worship and allegiance. So the thousand or so on Baal's side that have been shouting and dancing and, and cutting themselves in this manic activity, they finally give up. It's now Elijah's turn. And the people watching are about to experience the fourth movement, to experience the aha of God's presence and power and grace. You see, we read then, Elijah called to the people. He said, come over here. He calls to the people. It's like this pastoral moment. Come close. Come close. In front of them, he repairs the altar. And then he actually adds some extra challenges to make it supposedly harder for, Yah for Yahweh to, to win this contest. We, we read, he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about 15 liters he piled wood on the altar. He cut the bull into pieces, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, hey, go, go fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. In fact, he gets them to do this a couple more times. So at this point, everything's like drenched. I mean, there is no way anybody could light this, even if they had packets of fire starters and a box of matches to light. Elijah then prays a really simple prayer. 
O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Yahweh, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Yahweh, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. You know, that prayer stands in such contrast to the whole day where the prophets of Baal have been begging and pleading and cutting themselves and yet still been so unsuccessful. Elijah gets up in a simple prayer. There's no magic formula. There's no particular words. It's just like 30 seconds long to pray. And you look, listen to what happens. Immediately the fire of Yahweh flashed down from heaven and burnt up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust, even licked up all the water in the trench. Remember, there's like 15 liters of water in, in the trench alone, plus like 12 large jars of water. Everything licked up in a flash. We read when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. He's the real God. It's this aha moment when they come to a, to a fresh realization of the presence and power of God. God, we want you to be our God. We're all in for you, God. And this leads to the final movement in our story. To enjoy the fullness of life with God. You know, looking over the, the barren land, Elijah prays again. And in the distance, he sees a cloud and it's like... The rain starts to come and starts to fall. And, and God is restoring his promise, his blessing. And once again, the, the grapes are going to grow. The crops are going to be restored. And the people can once again enjoy the fullness of life with God. You now, friends, this is the heart of God, isn't it? It's the heart of God to bless you in ways beyond what you can imagine. You know, God wants your life to flourish. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is what he wants for you. God says, I want you to experience my blessing. And all I want is you. I want this exclusive relationship with you. I'm the one and the only one who can fill that God-shaped vacuum you have in your life. Only I can fill that infinite pit that you're trying so hard to, to fill through working too hard or spending too much or pursuing relationship to relationship or experience to relationship. And you still find your life empty and barren and thirsty. You know, Corey Ten Boom once said, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. I want to invite you today just to allow the love of God to fill you and to satisfy you. You know, God is here in this very moment, wherever you're connecting from, inviting you to clear the stage of your life of all the competition and just to follow him exclusively. And my prayer is that this day is the day when many of us will find that God can be our all in all. To, to work through all of these movements where we, where we see the problem, recognizing that something is wrong in a particular area of our lives. And then we see right there at the crossroads, we, we recognize that you have a choice. Will you continue to follow some bail substitute or will you allow God to shape that particular area of your life? Or will you see the empty promises of your own idols? Will you experience that aha moment of God's presence and power of course, these first four movements lead to their final one. Movement five, enjoying the fullness of life with God. And I want to provide some time just right now to give us an opportunity just to talk to the real God who demands the primary allegiance in our lives. So let's pause. I want to give you the opportunity just to speak to him because he wants to hear from you right in this moment. Let's pray together. Just use your own words. Speak to the one who is here, to the one who's listening. So, Father, forgive us for the times where we get so distracted. We find our identity and security, purpose, and all these other things. Today, we come to you 
we ask that you be our God, the one that we follow, the one who captures our imagination, the one who captures the affections of our heart. So come, Spirit of God, fill up that void. Help us to receive your love. May it wash over us again and again and again. Come, Holy Spirit, because we love you and we want to follow after you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name, amen.